So it's a joy and an honor to be back home. Um, before I get into the meaning of Ash Wednesday, I just wanted to say thank you for all your prayers. I, I was in Rome for several weeks of meetings uh, for the general chapter, and uh, congratulations to Father Joel Roche. God bless, he is the new superior general of the Marian Fathers. God bless him. And um, I got a chance to meet the Holy Father, and I guess my reputation precedes me because the General Curia came up to me before I met the Holy Father and basically said, do not bring up any topics of conversation that are, that are controversial. I said, well, I have a list here. They're like, no, <laughs> you, are, you are not to bring up these topics of conversation. I'm like, what about the Synod? What about this? What about that? So, so I guess the reputation preceded me, but uh, we pray for our, our, our office and, and the church hierarchy. I then went to Ireland, and I just wanted to briefly say a few words. I, in, in the midst of having been a brother and, and now a priest for a few years, I've traveled quite extensively speaking and meeting different people, and I, I, I just wanted to briefly say a few things, because in, in all my time... Um, in my whole life, I've never uh, been affected or experienced what I did in Ireland. Um, words cannot articulate what I experienced in Ireland. Um, I went there uh, for this past weekend, and there was 10,000 people at the largest Divine Mercy Conference that is held in Europe each year. And so I did a talk on Saturday. I got in, and as I left the stage, this line formed, and people were coming up um, for blessings, to ask for prayers. I have never, ever heard such suffering in my life. Person after person after person. And I, I stated, I know in, in America we have our challenges and we are, we are facing many hurdles, but I, I've never seen anything like this. Stories after stories after stories, just, just, just a couple. Um, one man came up just so despondent and put his head down and shared with me that his wife took their precious 18-month-old baby and left the house and proceeded to stand in front of a train. And he said, Father, I lost the only two things in my life that mattered to me. What do you say to somebody that goes through that? Then another couple came up to me at the table and said, their 16-year-old suicide is beyond rampant. And this couple came and said, Father, we lost our 16-year-old son to suicide. And his girlfriend, who this boy loved, um, became like part of their family, became like their daughter. And the only consolation in the midst of this darkness that they had was their faith, most of all, but was this girl who became, as I said, like their daughter. And as this young man's birthday approached after he had taken his life, she said, I'm, on his birthday, I'm going to be with him. And they thought that meant she was going to the cemetery. They thought that that meant she was going to visit his grave. But what it meant when she said she was going to be with him was she took her life on his birthday. I could go on and on about these stories, and why do I bring this up? Because, you know, there was one thing that the Irish I saw. Every story that I heard, it seemed to be followed by the question, Father, do you think this is because Ireland has turned away from God? Do you think that we are suffering like this as God's punishment? No, God is not out to keep a scorecard to punish you. But when we do turn away from God, we punish ourselves. The consequence of sin 
is something that we don't think about much today. And the consequence of sin will bring about suffering even for the innocent. At that moment, there was this huge crowd at the table. It was this massive gathering of people. And all of a sudden, through the midst of this crowd, came two arms and handed me a baby. And this little baby was wearing an oxygen mask wrapped around his ears. And I couldn't even see, just this baby came through the crowd and this, these two arms were holding this baby and gave me this baby. And I'm signing books and I'm talking with the people and I just stopped. And I took the baby and all I could think of is it was like the four men and the paralytic, right? Where they lowered the paralytic down. And, you know, most days I don't feel Christ-like. The only times I feel Christ-like is at this altar. This is a struggle that I have because I know my sins. I know my vices. But at that moment, I had never felt more Christ-like. I felt like they were bringing this baby, like the foreman and the paralytic. Now, I'm not saying I'm like Christ, I'm not, but a priest is in persona Christi. A priest is in the person of Christ, despite our sins and our brokenness. So I took this baby, and the woman stepped forward to proceed to tell me that his mother died when he was four weeks old. And they showed me the picture of his beautiful mother. And his father had left. And then his twin brother died. He was an orphan. And at that point I was like, I wonder if they'll let me take this baby home. <laughs> I don't think the community will allow me to raise a little child, but, but that's what my heart felt like doing. And this nanny who had the baby um, handed this baby. This was the most precious little baby I had ever seen. And he looked up at me, and I, I was just mesmerized, and I, I bent down to kiss his head. <laughs> and as I bent down, he took his little hand, he never cried, he never squirmed, he never was fidgety. He just sat there perfectly still the whole time and just looked up at me. And when I bent down to, to bless his head and to give his a little blessing, he reached up with his hand and he went like this. And I saw his smile and I was like, I've never experienced something like that. And then I knew what it was like to be a father. I've never been a father in a biological sense, but I have in a spiritual sense. And I realized that is what God gives to us in the priesthood, is being a father to so many. Then it occurred to me, what do I say to these people? As these people were coming, 10,000 of them, begging to understand their suffering, yet every one of them was asking, is it because we've turned away from God? And as I said, it, it's no, it's not God punishing. Do you think God's punishing this little baby? Because he's got a blood disorder? He has to wear oxygen. His mom died. His brother died. His father left. Is, no. But this is a consequence of your sin, of my sin. This is why the little baby 
is going through this. It's not God punishing the baby. When we turn away from God, we bring upon ourselves the absence of the good. Because God is goodness itself, and when we turn away from God, we turn away from goodness itself. And when we turn away from goodness itself, this is what is left. We are left to ourselves, and we are left to ourselves. There's nothing there now. It's not their fault. These people are seeking God, but they are shouldering the cross of Ireland, who is the first nation in the world to publicly vote in abortion and gay marriage. And they are seeing that. It's not their fault. These are the people they're begging for God's mercy. They are the people that this little tiny baby didn't do anything wrong. But this little tiny baby is a suffering servant carrying the cross of Christ. Those parents whose son took his life are, are, are suffering servants bearing the cross of Christ. That husband whose wife took her life with the baby is a suffering servant bearing the cross of Christ. Christ took on our sins. And it, was, it, it, it is this wake-up call that I had in Ireland like I've never experienced before. And I said, this is, this is unbelievable. And it, it occurred to me that this was right before Lent because Lent is now the time to turn back to God. And I implored the Irish people, you were chosen by God. The Irish saved Western civilization. The Irish monks, they saved the literature. They saved the art. They saved the faith. The Irish monks and the Irish people between 500 and 1500 AD, that thousand years, they saved the church and they saved Western civilization. And I said, you are going to need to do it again. And the only way you can do it again is you got to turn back to God. And what better time than today? What I really want to say about today is it's not just Ash Wednesday. As huge as Ash Wednesday is and the beginning of Lent, as important as that is, do you know what else today is? You know, I stand up here so many times and I say, today is an incredibly important day. And I come up the next day, today is an incredibly important day. You know what? They are, because this is our faith. Why is today so important? Okay, number one, it's the beginning of Lent, a time we've got to turn back to God. Number two, today is the Feast of the Chair of St. Peter. And I just mentioned, I had my list to bring up to the Holy Father. It was chopped up. We need to pray for our Holy Father. God gave us the church. And the chair of Peter. Today is that day. Do you think it's coincidental in the day that we are facing right now with so much confusion in the church? So much misunderstanding and so much lack of explanation that is causing so much confusion. We need to pray for our church and especially the office of the papacy. Today is the chair of St. Peter. We don't celebrate it as a feast. If it was a solemnity, we would, but Ash Wednesday, we celebrate instead. You know what else today is? Today is the anniversary when Jesus gave St. Faustina the image of divine mercy. Today is the anniversary of that. It was the Feast of Icons back in 1931 when Jesus received it from St. Faustina. This is an incredible day. And then on top of all that, from today to Divine Mercy Sunday is exactly 54 days. If you have been watching your emails and it at all looking online, you know the importance of the 54-day Rosary Novena. This has been a thing long before this year. The 54-day Rosary Novena, I, I beg you, if you can, please Pray that from now to Divine Mercy Sunday. It's split up in two parts of Thanksgiving and petition. The 54-day Rosary Novena, we need to offer it up. This way we prepare through Lent to receive the grace of Divine Mercy Sunday. You see, in Divine Mercy Sunday is a day that you receive complete forgiveness of not only all sins, but all punishment due to sin. So when Christ comes for you as, as the groom and you are the bride, you will be spotless to receive him. What I told Ireland, what I said to those people, is the fact that you, in order for you to come back, and, and, and lead the church and lead the world and save Western civilization, 
you got to be purified. And then it occurred to me, the Irish are being purified right now in the dark night of the soul. They are going through trial and tribulation and suffering. How many times people said their sons and daughters have left the church? We have to, before Divine Mercy Sunday, you cannot sin all the way up to it. And in fact, sin that morning and then decide, well, I'm going to quit go to confession and everything waped clean. It doesn't work that way. We have to have a rectification of the will. We have to have a firm purpose of amendment that we will leave sin behind, at least to the best of our abilities, at least to the best of our efforts. doesn't mean you're not going to fall. What it means is that you get up and you go to confession and you get back in a state of grace. Stay in a state of grace. So here's the thing, everybody. In order to get this grace of divine mercy Sunday, you just can't decide to change that day. It's not going to work. You have to work all the way through a period to break these bad habits. You know what it says people say it takes to break a bad habit? Six to eight weeks. Guess what we're talking about from now to divine mercy Sunday? About almost eight weeks. So if you remain faithful to, to, to penance and sacrifice and you turn back to God... You will be prepared and ready to receive the grace of Divine Mercy Sunday. This is critically important. We have so many things in the world today that are fighting and threatening our existence as a people and a church. One of the biggest is this crazy belief that socialism and communism are good. Do you know what also happened on this date, February 22nd? The 1980 USA hockey team defeated what seemed almost impossible to beat the red Russian machine of the Soviet Union. And you know who scored the game-winning goal? Michael Aruzioni. You see, Michael, St. Michael, will slay the red dragon. Do not think in these times that we do not have a battle in front of us. We do. And on this day in 1980, February 22nd, It seemed impossible to defeat this big, giant machine of evil, the Soviet Empire. And these ragtag group of uh, American college kids did just that. Why? Because they were focused on a mission. And we, too, need to be focused on this mission. What is our mission? In this time, during Lent, to rectify our lives, to give up our sins, to detach from those things that are keeping us from God, to break our bad habits over six to eight weeks so we are ready to receive him on Divine Mercy Sunday. And you can start today with fasting. You know how many Catholics, how many people I know say they're Catholic and don't even think about fasting or abstinence? So I finish with this. Today is a day of both fasting and abstinence. The rule of the church says on Ash Wednesday and Good Friday, those 18 to 59 years old are to fast. And it's not that difficult. It's two small meals, just little thing, little amounts, and one regular meal, I should say one regular meal and two small meals that do not together equal a full meal. 18 to 59 years old. It's not that difficult. Now, health reasons or whatever, of course, don't put yourself in jeopardy. Then for abstinence, like every Friday in Lent, we do not eat meat. That is for everybody over age 14. We have to start turning back. Remember Jesus said in the Gospels when they couldn't drive out those certain demons, the apostles asked Jesus, why can't we drive out this demon? And Jesus said, this is a tough one. It will only come out through prayer and fasting. If we do not do this, we are turning away from God, not God turning away from us. And the people of Ireland are starting to learn that. We in America need to support that. Please, I implore you, this Lent, change, repent, I'll be leading the way. I I had my list for Pope Francis, but my list was ten times bigger. And here's my list of things, and patience, and gluttony, and thoughts, and all the things on my list. I'm going to nail them up to the wall and beg God's mercy and the grace to overcome. But it ain't going to happen without prayer and fasting. If you are unable to fast, as I said, 
make other sacrifices. But this is the time to change our life. And you know what? God starts this day with so much grace. Next to Easter and Christmas and Divine Mercy Sunday, I don't know of another day that has more grace than today. You've got Ash Wednesday and the grace that begins Lent. You have the cheer of Peter and the grace that God gives us in our church. Pray for our Holy Father. You've got the anniversary of Jesus giving the icon of divine mercy to St. Faustina. This day is chock full of grace. We have no excuse. God is giving us all the tools. And if we make that change during Lent, we will be ready on Divine Mercy Sunday. I cannot imagine after this visit to Ireland anything more important in this world than what we're going to do the next seven to eight weeks and receive his grace on Divine Mercy Sunday. I beg all of you will join us. I beg all of you will practice the faith, live the Lenten penances, not extreme, but whatever God calls you to do. And let us stand united, not divided, as people of God. If we just turn back to God, we will see a huge difference. God bless you.